live everywhere. Daily Co's Radio on NetworksRadio.com presents David Walker, Kegro in the Morning Show. Now, here's David Waldman. Hi, how you doing, everybody? It is Thursday, November 21st, 2019. Time for yet another show here on, on Netroots Radio. I always love the way he winds up on that end. Okay, uh, we always end up, well, wind up being on the air, regardless of how long that end goes on. So we're ready, I think, sort of, to go. We'll be talking to Greg Dworkin, who, of course, will be bringing... Uh, guest commentator abby along with them at some point uh, another i think abbreviated segment although if we could just get the guys the uh, workmen to slow down a little bit on their way over we could hold on to them for a little bit longer but daily coast radio is live now we are reminded as usual by bill in portland maine who says that kgro x me david waldman has an exclusive preview of devin nunez's opening statement i think it's the same one he always gives at today's impeachment hearings Moo, <laughs> this never gets old. Yeah, this is really one of the more unusual stories. The whole saga has been just Devin Nunes and his strange lawsuits. I mean, I think that should be front page news all by itself, regardless of the fact that it happens to be tangentially attached to an impeachment hearing, which is taking up an awful lot of oxygen. Anyway, lots to get through today. More hearings happening today. Fiona Hill, I think, is on the hill. Damn, I left myself with nowhere to go on that one. But uh, she's back for more testimony today. It looks to be looks to be a hot one. Who else is testifying along with her? Is it uh, not Holmes, but uh, the other the other guy whose name begins with H? Dang, I forgot. I already lost the schedule. Uh, but uh, we we added the additional source to the uh, to the hearings today so it won't be just Fiona Hill but I think they're doing them both in one panel so that's uh, that ought to be interesting and uh, worth listening to I guess the opening statement from Hill's testimony has been released to the press and so there's been uh, some Twitter distribution of what she had to or what she will have to say Uh, Some rather lengthy excerpts, but it seems like she's going to start things out. I don't know if it's the first thing in her in her statement, but she's going to use her opening statement to try to I mean, I don't think it's going to work. Republicans are going to just run right over her on this one, but to try to lay out for the listening audience that uh, we should not be and she won't be entertaining any stupid alternative theories about who interfered in the 2016 elections that the Republicans have as part of their agenda, such as it is for these hearings and for this investigation, for the entire discussion of the episode that we're investigating here, they want you to believe the the parallel narrative, which apparently, by the way, Russians are very interested in having us believe as well. Uh, but she doesn't want anyone to go in for this stupid idea that, no, it wasn't really the Russians, it was actually the Ukrainians who interfered in 2016, who hacked the DNC server, who may have the DNC server. Um, And uh, I believe also circulating now on Twitter are purported quotations from Putin's remarks to some sort of international assembly uh, in the last couple of days, sort of trying to complete this play by saying thank god no one believes that russia interfered in the american elections anymore in 2016 and that we all finally know that it's the ukrainians just hoping that everyone will sort of adopt that position as true rather than the real one and i guess fiona hill doesn't want anything to do with it uh i don't think that republicans will abide by it but it'll make an interesting play to see her open by saying yeah, that's not a real thing, and anyone who puts it forward is an idiot, and then we will see which idiots put it forward. Now, I, she doesn't have the power to stop them, and no one can stop them from being idiots, so I suppose we'll just we'll just see it play it out, play itself out that way. Also in the news this morning, and we'll have to get to it, we'll, we'll probably read through the article a little bit 
later in our show, since we'll be likely making way for Greg instead. But a hot topic of discussion. Ah, is it Holmes? Greg is uh, sending me some notes. All right, well, now he's going to be here and he can answer the question. But also, hot topic of discussion today, the Daily Beasts article, Assembly. which reveals... Uh, oh, there I am. Hi, everyone. Um, that uh, reveals that Lev Parnas apparently had some role in arranging meetings for Devin Nunes and staff while they made their way through Europe. So that's pretty interesting. The ranking minority member on the investigative panel is a fact witness or ought to be now, um, you know, by rights would be disqualified and uh, required to stand aside during the investigation, but uh, not under these rules <laughs> because they're so restrictive and prevent Republicans from doing what they really want. Uh, they are allowed to uh, be co-conspirators to the crime in question and lead investigators as well. So that's an interesting mix we have in our legislative branch here uh, in the United States. We'll help you unravel it later on. In the meantime, Greg is here. We've got to get to him before the stonemasons show up. Absolutely, which is going to be uh, before the break. So, again, a little oh, no. shortened uh, time today. But we'll, we'll be we'll back listen. to the usual schedule by next week. You know, it's it's funny. Uh, Fiona Hill's going to say, I refuse to be part of an effort to legitimize an alternative narrative that the Ukrainian government is a U.S. adversary and that Ukraine, not Russia, attacked us in 2016. These fictions are harmful, even if they are deployed for purely domestic political purposes. She's going to look at Devin Nunes and then what should happen but won't is that uh, Adam Schiff would say, uh, uh, Ranking Member Nunes, you should disqualify yourself in these hearings. And we would like you as a fact witness, along with Ron Johnson, the senator, uh, who, who uh, appears to have been right in the middle of uh, a lot of these uh, 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 fake uh, 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 setups mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, 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 to hide what was going on with the Ukrainian intervention. And But that won't happen. What will happen is that the American public is going to hear Fiona Hill basically uh, uh, say that actually uh, the Russians did this in the study with the lead pipe uh, <laughs> yes. uh, aided and abetted by uh, Republicans. I mean, that's basically what she's going to say. And uh, we'll see how it, it, uh, how it lands. And then the other guy who's testifying today is David Holmes is going to say, yeah, I overheard the phone call. And the funny thing was – he was on like a normal cell phone. And so uh, as people on Twitter have pointed out, let's be clear about this. He wasn't in the least bit worried about the Russians overhearing this. They're not going to depose him. Right. What he wanted to make sure is that none of his conversations were recorded by the U.S. government as per uh, law so that uh, this way uh, the uh, Freedom of Information Act doesn't cover it. And nobody could subpoena this stuff because nobody would know about it, you know, but her emails. Yeah, I don't know if he succeeded in doing that yet. Well, it, it failed, just like a lot of this stuff failed, you know, but he's very he's jolly her. about it, so obviously yeah. none of it counts. That I guess so, as long as, well, they did teach us in uh, media training, right? As long as you smile at the camera, you're, you're going to be okay. Right, and uh, he learned his lessons. All right. So, uh, you know, we, we have the details on Fiona Hill's um, uh, statement, and uh, she's going to talk about, she's, she's a Brit, she's going to talk about being an American by choice. It's a pretty long mm -hmm. statement. Uh, but what she says is the unfortunate truth is that Russia was the foreign power that systematically attacked our democratic institutions in 2016. Do you remember who was elected in 2016? This is the public conclusion of our intelligence agencies confirmed in bipartisan congressional reports. It's beyond dispute, even if some of the underlying details must remain classified. Mm. In other words, we know the Republicans cheated. We just can't tell you. Which is, you know, a lot of the problem with the Mueller report. Yeah, well, that's not very. Yeah, it's not very helpful to do things that way. Can we call her Fee by any chance? I mean, uh, does she well, go by Fee at all? She's uh, British. You, I really you, like you, the idea. You know, I think she'll smack you. So I, I would. Yeah, do I mean, that. I don't want to be near her when I. But when but I let's that. talk about yesterday a little that. bit. Uh, yes. Because a lot okay. happened yesterday, like eleven hours of yesterday, and so uh, the first thing, 24. of course, is that there was this amazing, amazing uh, uh, testimony by Gordon Sondland. Uh, you know, yes. and uh, let me just mention a part of it that uh, perhaps will get a little bit underplayed, but ought to be in your mind. And this is a political piece. Impeachment hearings putting Trump through the emotional ringer. At different mm -hmm. times, Trump's been calm, cheery and pissed, according to those around him. Mm -hmm. On Wednesday, he was frustrated and uncharacteristically terse. 
you know, so as, as uh, oh my goodness, Mason, that is terse. As uh, Molly John Fast puts it, yes. when Trump is out criming, <laughs> you pause. You know, it, yes. it, it it takes a toll, and so I don't know if Trump is just going to go and do more self impeaching the way Nancy Pelosi says he does because he's just going to you know lose it, or whether he's going to yeah. have more unscheduled uh, 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 physicals. Uh, yes, right. Oh, well, that'll certainly happen. Right. But, uh, I mean, a lot can happen, and his reaction is kind of like one of the known unknowns. But in any case, uh-huh. it was a big, big day yesterday. Sondland basically said, yeah, it was a quid quo quo. Everybody was involved. Everybody was in the loop, as he likes to say. Pompeo absolutely knew everything I was doing, and he shouldn't be trusted because he's a known liar. Hmm. Yes, that's bad. Um, but I didn't hear Trump directly say that I should go ahead and uh, make sure that the the Ukrainians knew that uh, they have to give us uh, these uh, interviews. But what he did say, which was so crystal clear, is that Trump didn't want investigations. He wanted the announcement of an investigation. Sondland said it twice under questioning. Yes. And so he made it really clear it had nothing to do with uh, uh, concerns about corruption and everything to do with the uh, 2020 election and trying to smear a rival. And Sodden so much as said that. And the Republican defense, which started out really bizarrely, it's as if Devin Nunes had never really read Sodden's statement because hmm. Nunes said, well, the Democrats are going to smear him and he's a fine man. And then as Sodden testified, you could <laughs> see it's just cringe and crumple. And then they had to uh, take a break. And the, the way the break was, is that uh, Dan Goldman did the questioning with uh, Adam Schiff as as is normal in these hearings. And then it's usually turned over to Devin Nunes and uh, the Republican counsel. But there was a break between then. So uh, the Republican counsel and Nunes didn't get to make their statement right away. Nunes had almost no- nothing to say because he had to recalibrate what he was going to do. And by the afternoon, they had arrived at, well, you can't prove that Hitler actually gave an order to kill all the Jews. <laughs> right. Yes. Therefore, the whole thing didn't happen. Okay. That's, That's the analogy, and, and it may defense. sound stupid, but that is the exact analogy. And Holocaust deniers actually use that excuse real time. Yes. I mean, they, they say stuff like that. And, that. and that's the logic here. I didn't hear him say it. You can't show me that you spoke to him and he said there, at least you won't admit that. Hmm. But what Sondland did do, this basically show that Volcker and uh, a number of other people, including Morrison, who testified the day before, mm-hmm. uh, are basically liars. In other words, the three amigos or the three stooges or whatever you want to call them are basically making the argument that we had no idea that Burisma and Biden were the same thing. We couldn't possibly. How could we? Rudy's mm-hmm. only been tweeting about it since May and it was all over the New York Times front page. But how could we know? Yes. I mean, we're experts in the field. We're there to do all the nuance. We're the professionals who are talking to Ukraine about everything Ukraine. But how could we possibly know that Rudy was talking about Ukraine and the media for months? Mm. How could we possibly know that? We're professionals. Yes. Well, that's where circumstantial evidence comes in and, and actually that, that's helps. That's where Volker and Marson come in. I mean, you could you could say, look, Sondland is an idiot. And I, I totally believe that he didn't do his job and didn't do his homework and didn't pay any attention to this. But you can't make that case for Volcker and Morrison. Hmm. And, well, I mean, at the very least, you're, you're you able to say... You can hardly make the case for Sondland, but you certainly yeah. can't make it for the other two. No, they ought not to have fallen for that, and no one should believe that they couldn't figure that out. And uh, even even without that, actually, I mean, you know, the back to the part about, well, you never heard the president say this. Uh, no, that's true. But the, the circumstantial evidence, which is not not evidence, that's counter to what people <laughs> learn on television dramas. It's real evidence. It just needs other stuff to help get you to proof. But if five, six, seven independent actors, many of them experts in the field, come to the conclusion that that's what the president has intended, you know, each one, any one of them, it might be excused for making the mistake seven times over among seven individuals on two continents becomes very difficult to believe it was just an error. All right. Me- meanwhile, Mike Pompeo was just flat out lying about his role. Nobody yes. ever talked to me about any of this. He's told, uh, you know, that's uh, true. 
the Raditz, and we and we know that, that that's simply well, not, not we've true. We've left that aside, yes. And Jake Sherman covers pretty well here. You know, he says, look what's happened to all the GOP defenses during the process. First, it was no quid pro quo. That's pretty much gone. Yeah. Then there was no ask for probe of Biden's. That fell away, especially because Trump asked for it, as the Chinese do. <laughs> then it was no, Ukraine didn't know about the aid freeze. And that's the other part of what happened yesterday. Ah. Because the person testifying, Laura Cooper, from the Pentagon, basically said, you uh, had my sworn testimony. But since then, I learned from my staff that the Ukrainians started asking about the freeze the aid freeze, the day Trump had his phone call on July 25th with the famous transcript, mm-hmm. non-transcript. Yes, right. Did and they... Trump and others had been tweeting, it couldn't be extortion because right. the Ukrainians didn't know about the freeze until much later. Mm-hmm. And she said, my staff informs me the Ukrainians started asking about the freeze that day. So they knew about it months before the Trump administration is claiming that they knew. Okay. We're lying about that. And so that defense is gone. And what they're left with is, well, you don't have direct evidence that Donald Trump told you to go extort the Mm -hmm. Ukrainians. He didn't use that word. Yes. Well, they love to rely on that word. He didn't use that word. Then it doesn't count. And Ari Melber was great about explaining how this works. You know, if a fact witness says, I saw the car crash, I saw the guy deliberately drive over the pedestrian and then dance on him. And the defense yes. says, but did you hear him use the word vehicular homicide? <laughs> right. Yes. Well, and I can't believe says, I did. I don't know what that means. I'm not a lawyer. I just saw him run over the guy. Yeah. And I remember just making the point. That's enough. You don't expect a fact witness to uh-huh. use terms like bribery, extortion, and by the way, quid pro quo. That's for the lawyers. All you want the fact witnesses to tell you what happened. That's what they did. This happened. And so the defense of, well, he didn't say it, really doesn't hold up. The problem, of course, everybody understands this, Mm -hmm. is that Democrats have done their job. Here's the front page of the New York Times, the print page. Big banner headlines, like war-sized headlines. We followed the president's orders. And talking about the Hitler analogy, you don't have to explain that. Everybody knows what that means. We followed orders. Mm -hmm. How well did that go? That's not Ah. much of a defense, is my point. Yes, that's not good. It's historically not good. Right. Uh, the the sub headlines here: Witness places Pompeo firmly in the loop. Democrats detect Watergate echo. Sondland names top officials in Ukraine push. Those aren't the headlines that the Republicans wanted. The point I'm making is that the Democrats have done their job. They did a really masterful uh, construction, including working in the Roger Stone conviction oh, yeah, so <laughs> into the sequence of events, so that we learned over time that uh, the professional diplomats were cut out of the loop for no good reason. And like Ambassador Yovanovitch, were smeared. And while she's testifying to this, Trump smears her to prove the point. And then that what really was going on was this whole back channel, what uh, the Democrats had been calling irregular channel of trying to extort and bribe the Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. And Sondland helpfully says, yes, that all happened. But not only did that all happen, I have to make a correction to your narrative here. All right. Mm -hmm. Because you're saying it was in a regular channel. I'm saying I was told to do this by the president, by the secretary of state, by the national security advisor, by office of management and budget. And how can you say what I was doing was irregular? In other words, one of the other Trump defenses is he was freelancing. Remember that one? Yes. That's because he said, no, I wasn't freelancing. Right. I was more regular channel than the other guys were regular channel. I was being told to do this by everybody in the chain of command. 
Uh, well, a lot of people oh, who are. Oh, yes. you're right. <laughs> that was the regular channel. That would implicate, of course, all those other people. But in fact, that's what happened. Mm. Or as Neera Tandon tweeted this morning, uh, paraphrasing, because I don't have the tweet in front of me. My God, this isn't an investigation. It's a crime family. I mean, that's exactly Aww. what's going on here. And I turned over from MSNBC to NBC just because I wanted to see Chuck Dodd's reaction. Oh, yeah. What did he have to say? I, I uh, happened to hit on this other person whose name I didn't get, who was uh, saying, you know, the problem with Sondland's not taking notes and, and being an amateur and this and that and everything else, of course, is that you want to be very clear that you understand what the instructions are from mm -hmm. the people above you in the chain of command. And the trouble with Trump's management style is that people under him don't always know what he wants because he's not really clear. And I'm thinking, no, 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 no. <laughs> this is a bureaucrat trained to assume yes. that this is all being done in good faith, trying to do a uh, best management practices analysis of what is, in effect, a crime family. This is not a bug. It's a feature. He deliberately insulates himself from that. The reason he says, talk to Rudy, talk to my lawyer, talk to Michael Cohen, is he wants the veneer of lawyer-client privilege to protect himself from having to discuss what he tells his subordinates to do. Michael Cohen broke that code and explained Trump doesn't give you orders. He lets you know what he wants to do so he can shield himself of saying, well, I didn't tell him to go. You know, uh, I, I said, who would rid me of that meddlesome yes, right. priest? I didn't say go out and kill the guy. My yeah. subordinates did that. They right. must have misunderstood what I said. Whoops. Whoops. Yeah. I mean, and, and yeah. so the whole concept of trying to analyze Trump from the basis of best management practice is ridiculous. No, you do this as if it's a crime family. That's why you have to look at it as a whole RICO organization. That's what's exactly. going on here. And there are people like Chuck Todd and others who simply can't grasp and make that jump, just like the media still has trouble trying to figure out what do you do with somebody who deliberately is lying to you in order to get you to, uh, you know, because they know their advantage over you is they know you have to treat him as the president of the United States. And therefore, if he says something, you have to print it. Yes. And he's using that. He's weaponizing that. He's weaponizing your inability to call him a liar to lie all the time. That's what's going on here. And when you do the analysis, that's what you have to do. So I said, this is terrible. And I went right back to MSNBC, although they did break through that and say, yes, but this is really what's going on. But this is a crime syndicate. And so they have to decide they have enough evidence to impeach him. That's not even the question. I guess the point I'm trying to make is the Democrats oh. have done their job. The problem is the Republicans won't do theirs. And so until or unless the polls change, they're not going to move. We all know that. It's got nothing to do with logic. All of their defenses have crumbled. It's going to be Devin Nunes complaining about the cow. I mean, basically what he does is, uh, I don't know if you uh, saw the David Byrne movie, uh, uh, True Stories. It's about a small Texas town that he grew up in. It's, it's semi-autobiographical with uh, whimsy. And uh, one of the things he has in there is a, is a song called Puzzling Evidence, which is basically done by a paranoid preacher talking about how, you know, the Kennedys did everything and, and uh, this and that. And, and uh, uh, you know, it's a beautifully done rendition of conspiracy theory. And basically, Devin Nunes gets up and sings that song. And, you know, he does the whole Puzzling Evidence thing. And, uh, you know, that's that's his opening statement every day. Yes. And the nice thing about Fiona Hill is that she's going to come and say, listen, the Republicans, this is all garbage being pushed by Putin. What is wrong with you people? And so, again, it's not the Republicans in Congress right now who you expect to respond to this. It's you know, it's the voters. So you got to wait a week. Today's Thursday. By Monday or Tuesday, we'll see if there's any movement in the polls or not. But that was like two thirds of yesterday. And then, of course, it was followed by the debate. All I'll say about the debate is I thought the moderators were excellent. They didn't have That's good. The, uh, the, the candidates fighting with each other. Everybody had a pretty strong debate. Or as, uh, you know, Ian Milhouse put it, uh, you know, the person I really like had a really strong debate. And the person who I think is the most uh, threatening to my candidate was awful. <laughs> yes, and that's basically that's the, the best way to, to do it. 
But I like Michael Miller, political scientist, who wrote Biden's gaffe, and he had a few of them, like uh, claiming that the only uh, African-American woman senator endorsed him. Oh, yes. Uh, Kamala Harris said, you know, what am I, chop liver? You forgot me. I met first, you know, not only. And, of course, uh, but Biden's gaffe was oh. bad. But, hey, political science Twitter, we can't teach our students that campaign effects are small and debates don't matter at 11 a.m., and then join the pundits in saying Biden is over now at 11 p.m. Uh, that, yeah, that's not how it works. Most of the time, it yeah. really doesn't make that much difference. And the fact is, everybody had at some point, if you want to pick a clip, a strong answer, strong debate, including Biden. Biden is Biden. You know, he he's shaky. He's always shaky at these debates. These are not good uh, forums or, or uh, venues for him. But he is who he is. And none of his other debates has changed his standing. This won't either. Mayor Pete, who's doing fairly well right now, new civics poll, again, showing him in the lead in Iowa, is doing fine, but he still doesn't have any African-American support. It doesn't matter in Iowa. It does everywhere else. Um, uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren is no longer on an up trajectory. She's on a down trajectory. The people I thought had the best debate personally yesterday were uh, Cory Booker and Amy Klobuchar. And whether or not it makes any difference at all will remain to be seen. And uh, we'll see. There's still a lot of time left. Okay. Well, good. There's also a lot of time left in this show. So (laughs) I'm glad we have at least some recap of what happened there. As I mentioned, I was at my Burisma board meeting and I missed the debate again. It's like the ninth one in a row. But I appreciate getting an update on that one. There were some people who watched it. Yeah, uh, I watched uh, most of it. I mean, it, uh, it was supposed to be two hours. It ran about two hours and 15 minutes. So it was about 20 minutes toward the end that I sort of had something else to do. But uh, saw the recap. So that's basically it. Okay. Everybody's going to forget about the debate. The important events from yeah. yesterday are the impeachment yes. hearings. I think so. And I wondered if uh, I wonder if we'll get any information about ratings, like the one thing that uh, Donald Trump cares about. I wonder if other people were a little politicked out by that time or, or what. But okay. We shall see. Yes, we'll find out. Uh, time for our break. We'll be back in two minutes and I'll bring you more. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for KGRO in the Morning, and I've learned that I either need to update these announcements more often or stop saying that the announcements are brand new. What's not new is that this message, too, is a call for your support in keeping the KGRO in the Morning show on the air. My thanks go out to all of you who do support the show through your donations. The stats say that KGRO in the Morning fans download our program about 2,000 times each weekday, but our donors make up only about 8% of our daily listeners. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it simple to make easy, secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. If we're helping keep you sane during the Trump era, consider what that's worth. A dollar a day? Fifty cents? One thin dime? We do about 20 shows a month, so pick a number, do the math, and head to Patreon.com slash KGROX to let us know. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. Welcome back now to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Uh, Let's see, I think we'll start off, uh, because I mentioned it earlier and I want to follow up on it before we forget, I'll give you the Daily Beast story, the exclusive story, and I think it is still exclusive. I imagine it'll be written up elsewhere by late this morning. Lev Parnas helped Representative Devin Nunes's investigations. It's a little awkward to read aloud as a headline, but makes good sense in print. This is Betsy Swan reporting for the Daily Beast. It's not chock full of information, but it's an interesting door to look behind. Subheader here reads, The indicted Giuliani associate, that's Lev Parnas, helped arrange meetings and calls in Europe for the Republican congressman in 2018. So it's not like it's a very, very long time ago. It's right in the middle of everything. Lev Parnas, in addition to all his other jobs this guy has, right? All the companies he's running, he's translating for Dimitro Firtash, quote unquote translating. Uh, he's uh, starting fraud guarantee. He's producing movies. He's developing real estate. He's exporting liquid natural gas. He's getting rid of the United States ambassador to Ukraine. And he is shepherding... Uh, Devin Nunes and staff around Europe. 
Lev Parnas, an indicted associate of Rudy Giuliani, helped arrange meetings and calls in Europe for Representative Devin Nunes in 2018. Parnas's lawyer, Ed McMahon, still laughing at that one, but we have called that lawyer's name before, also still laughing at the 19 lawyers that Lev Parnas has. McMahon told the Daily Beast, Nunes aide Derek Harvey, and we've read a brief profile on him and what sort of dirty trickster type fellow he is uh, in the not too distant past. Nunes aide Derek Harvey participated in the meeting. Should we, uh, maybe I'll pull out that profile out of the archives uh, to see if we can remind ourselves of exactly who he is. He participated in the meetings, the lawyer said, which were arranged to help Nunes's investigative work. I mean, that's, that's their claim. McMahon didn't specify what those investigations entailed. Nunes is the top Republican on the House committee handling the impeachment hearings, hearings where Parnas's name has repeatedly come up, as it should, because he's a big part of this. Congressional records show Nunes traveled to Europe from November 30th to December 3rd, 2018. So at this point, he is still chairman of the Intelligence Committee and... Uh, though it is clear that the results of the election are going to turn over control in early 2019 to Adam Schiff. But this is the last gasp he has with control over the committee budget. So he travels to Europe from November 30th to December 3rd, 2018. Three of his aides, Derek Harvey, Scott Glabe, I don't believe we've talked about him at all, and George Pappas not ring a bell for me, except it sounds like George Papadopoulos, uh, traveled with him per the records. And the records are linked here, uh, just House government uh, travel reports. U.S. government funds paid for the group's four-day trip, which cost just over $63,000. That's, that's quite a bit. The travel came as Nunes in his role in the House Intelligence Committee was working to investigate the origins of the special counsel Robert Mueller's probe into Russian election meddling. In other words, this is his last chance to expense to the government the a, a trip to Europe to try to establish the alternative narrative that Fiona Hill is spending her morning trying to convince everybody is, and rightly so, is is complete nonsense. He spent $63,000 trying to prove that it was true, uh, and I guess he didn't get anywhere because nobody but Republicans believes it. Is it uh, I'm going to take a look at the report here because it doesn't say where he went. It just says Europe, and I'm curious. Now, there's George Pappas. Uh, oh, interesting. George Pappas is listed... Hmm. As uh, having uh, gone to Africa, interestingly enough. Hmm. Uh, but this was, although those trips were in late October, does this not include? I don't see. Yeah, I wonder if uh, oh, I'm just going to scan for Nunes. There's Scott Glabe. Yeah, these are late October's. Uh, Scott Glabe is listed as going to Asia and Europe. I mean, that's pretty vague, but I guess everybody seems to be vague about where they were going. I guess you're allowed to give something as large as the continent on which you were going. There's Kash Patel, by the way, also listed in here. Derek Harvey's trip is supposedly to Africa. Kash Patel goes to Asia and Africa. Interesting. Um, but these, these don't match the dates, nor does this page appear to have, uh, Congressman, uh, well, there's another trip for Kash Patel, both to Africa, no, those in, in late, uh, late, uh, November after all. Kash Patel actually has a couple of things. There's a Europe trip here. He's, he's got a number of listings that is, uh, that's surprising. And a few other names, too, here. Oh, well, we'll look back at this perhaps uh, <clears throat> another time. Anyway, we'll continue with this. 
Um, interesting, though. I wonder where they might have been in Africa and for what reason. The travel came as Nunes in his role in the House Intelligence Committee was working to investigate the origins of Special Counsel Robert Mueller's probe into Russian election meddling. I can't think of a African connection for that. Parnas's assistance to Nunes's team has not been previously reported. That's interesting because, you know, an honest congressman probably would have offered that up at some point. A spokesperson for Nunes did not respond to requests for comment. Nunes has been helming the GOP's involvement in the impeachment inquiry. He has spent much of his time criticizing the probe and the media's coverage of it. And a quote here from him on that. In their mania to attack the president. No conspiracy theory is too outlandish for the Democrats. A little projection there, you think? He said on Wednesday morning before Ambassador Gordon Sondland's testimony, later in the day, Nunes accused Democrats of harboring Watergate fantasies. I guess they fantasize about this at night, he said. Hmm. Don't want to speculate on what kind of projection that might be. Giuliani has been the subject of much discussion at the impeachment hearings. To a lesser extent, so have Parnas and his associate Igor Fruman, who worked with Giuliani as he attempted to find damaging information on Joe and Hunter Biden from Ukrainian sources. Nunes has been at the center of the broader story about foreign influence in President Donald Trump's Washington. When congressional investigators began probing Russian interference in the 2016 campaign, Nunes made a late-night visit to the White House and announced the next day he'd found evidence of egregious wrongdoing by intelligence community officials, which he was never able to nail down and prove in any way, despite helming the intelligence committee for those years. The move appeared to be an effort to corroborate a presidential tweet claiming that Obama wiretapped Trump Tower. I don't think Nunes ever really took it seriously himself. He just he was trying to corroborate this tweet. Nunes then stepped back from the committee's work, scrutinizing Russian efforts. Instead, he ran a parallel probe looking at the origins of Mueller's Russia probe. The undertaking made him a hero to the president and Sean Hannity and a bait noir of Democrats in intelligence community officials. That work was still underway when he traveled to Europe. OK, this is what they're pinpointing to Europe in 2018. Well, you know what's in Europe, of course. That makes it very difficult. You know, was it Ukraine? I don't know. That's Europe. Last month, federal prosecutors in the Southern District of New York charged Parnas and Fruman with illegally moving money from foreign donors to American political campaigns. Both men maintain their innocence. Contrary to many aspersions in the press to date, Lev Parnas is a proud United States citizen who has lived here since he was four years old, said Joseph Bondi, and another attorney, on Parnas's legal team. That that didn't appear to work. I mean, we can't blame Joe Bondi for it, but that excuse didn't appear to work with Republicans for Colonel Vindman the other day, but should have. Raised in Brooklyn and now living in Florida, Mr. Parnas is happily married with six children, which is really, it's, it's illegal to marry six children in uh, most of the United States, I think probably everywhere. So I'm not really sure why they put it that way. But um, I'm reliably informed that, that I'm misinterpreting things here. Raised in Brooklyn, now living in Florida, Mr. Parnas is happily married to a wife, most likely with whom he has six children. Five living at home. I'm not certain what that's supposed to Does that mean that they're very young or they can't get jobs? Or I'm not certain which. I think some of them are very young. Uh, if not, if we're not mistaken, we read the other day that uh, Rudy Giuliani was at one of their bris ceremonies. So we're talking about a relative newborn. Maybe the kid would be a toddler now. Uh, scarred for life, but a toddler nonetheless. Five living at home. Big deal. And a zeal for America and its democratic values, including allowing you to live in freedom after marrying six children at the same time. At all times throughout... He has believed that what he was doing was furtherance, was furtherance, was in furtherance, maybe, of the president's and thus our national interests. It's a, it's a mistake, uh, but it's an understandable mistake at the outset. You, if you're trained to think that the president is almost always assuredly acting in the national interest. Donald Trump furthers that myth, certainly by claiming that his interests 
uh, not only are identical with, but define the national interests. And if you buy into his particular stupid version of the prosperity gospel slash prosperity constitution, then it's easy to see how you would believe. It. Okay, so the excuse from the lawyer is that Lev Parnas thought he was doing what was in the national interest because the president was telling him to do it. Now, this is interesting. President Trump's recent and regrettable disavowal of Mr. Parnas has caused him to rethink his involvement and the true reasons for his having been recruited <laughs> to participate in the president's activities. I mean, he elbowed his way into those activities. The activities, I mean, a better, this is, remember, this is Parnas, his lawyer speaking, so he's not going to say it, but I think a, a, a good alternative theory, let's say, since Republicans accept alternative theories, is that uh, part, the activities the president undertook were undertaken in part at Parnas's prompting. His offer of being able to help establish this fake alternative story is what got him into that and the money, got him into Republican circles and close enough to the president to be asked, for instance, to take on that secret mission. I don't think we read that story. We'll have to do that next. All right. President Trump's recent and regrettable disavowal of Mr. Parnas has caused him to rethink his involvement and the true reasons for his having been recruited to participate in the president's activities. Mr. Parnas is prepared to testify completely and accurately, except he's a mobster and we wonder about that, about his involvement in the president and Rudy Giuliani's quid pro quo demands of Ukraine. So that'll come up at trial. Aren't you really a mobster or are you hoping to get a lighter sentence by testifying against the president? Yes. Okay. Well, all right, let's move on then. What else have you got to tell us? When Nunes traveled to Europe in 2018, Giuliani, who is Trump's personal attorney, was working to oust Ambassador Marie Yovanovitch from her post in Kiev. The Justice Department indictment of Parnas and Fruman alleges they illegally moved money into American elections to, quote, advance the political interests of a Ukrainian government official. That was that came up before. And we've never really figured out exactly who they mean by that. You know, probably people who are looking at it very closely, like Empty Wheel, might be able to guess at who that Ukrainian official is. But they were moving money into American politics to advance the political interests of a Ukrainian government official who sought the dismissal of U the U.S. ambassador to the Ukraine. That is interesting. Allegations against Yovanovitch blew up in American conservative media, including The Hill, thanks to John Solomon, and on Sean Hannity's Fox News show, Donald Trump Jr. even joined the chorus of voices calling for Yovanovitch to be recalled, and on May 20th, she was. Numerous U.S. officials, however, have testified to the impeachment inquiry that the claims against her were baseless. Yovanovitch herself testified to investigators last week. As with all, all, all the other impeachment hearings, Nunes led Republicans questioning of her. And that is the conclusion of the article. So uh, it uh, leaves us wanting more, certainly, but uh, definitely worth looking, uh, keeping in mind in the background as, as uh, Nunes does his thing today. This guy who's conducting the work for Republicans, and a, uh, by the way, a great observation made yesterday, and I'll have to run back and get us the tweet in which it was said, but the observation, the key to the whole thing, was uh, starting to look like a master stroke here is the design of the rules for the conduct of these hearings, which, uh, you know, Republicans complain about bitterly. But it seemed like a relatively neutral formulation of the rules for, here it is, uh, it's Greg Pinello who uh, made this comment, masterstroke by shift to set up the rules, and again, before I even give him his credit, uh, with the line, using what appears to be a neutral formulation of the rules, that I will have time, then the ranking member will have time, and then my committee council will have time, and then his committee council will have time, and then we'll go to members. Um, that's that's pretty neutral sounding. It's fair sounding. Everybody gets their chance. Majority goes first, minority goes second, but we rotate back and forth. It makes a certain amount of sense, but Greg's saying masterstroke here by shift to set up the rules 
to force Nunes to carry the GOP, GOP, Republican load. And uh, that in response to Susan Hennessy's observation that Devin Nunes is really, really not up to this moment. And that's that's really it. Nunes was I mean, he's a known factor. He just can't really sustain interest or weave together a credible narrative. And he certainly can't think on his feet when he's presented with something that he didn't anticipate before. He's not a he can't call an audible and credibly lead his defense on the field without, you know, when, when the plan blows up. And so good point, I think, by Greg, a masterstroke by Schiff to say uh, it's going to be uh, on Nunez to carry this load. Yes, later in the hearing, he can yield time to Jim Jordan. Yes, later in the hearing, he can yield time to John Ratcliffe. Uh, and I guess now, uh, Elise, uh, what's her name? Sto- so- Stofanic? Is that Stefanic? Stefanic, that's right. Um, so, okay, she emerges in all this, but you have to wait, uh, you know, an hour and a half or more. The opening statement takes a half an hour, two hours into the hearing before you get the chance to allow Jim Jordan to start yelling at people. That's, that is a master stroke. And they get the chance, so all the members of the committee have their opportunity. It's just that for the first critical couple of hours, the only Republicans who get to speak are Devin Nunes and his idiot Republican counsel. So good point there. Um, Well taken. Put that aside. Make sure that it's available for you in the roundup. Uh, Let's see. The other thing I wanted to go to. Let's see. We were I should have made notes to myself here and I should have shouted something that we were reading about Lev Parnas leading the, ah, yes, right. We um, wanted to know more. Oh, what was it exactly? Dang, now I about Lev Parnas. It briefly flashed into my mind and then out again. We were reading about, uh, let's see, he was arranging the trips um, that he changed his mind about the how the president was treating him. Let me just comb through. There was also something in the archives. Oh, yes, the archive. Now I'll make this note to myself. The archives we wanted about uh Derek what's his name the aide who goes on the trip and that was I'll scroll back here uh Derek Harvey okay and the arrangement on the desk here is not ideal what was um I just have now I feel like I have to scroll through to make sure that I definitely get it. So he goes, he, let's see, there was the comparison that we made to Vindman about both of them growing up here, but that wasn't it. Uh, working to get Yovanovich ousted, the belief that he was working in the national interest. Uh, hmm, I cannot remember, and I'm going to have to scroll. Well, I'll, I'll scroll through the other uh, interesting information that we have here. And then hopefully I will spot the uh, Parnas story. It was a Parnas story, wasn't it? That uh, we thought was so interesting here that I that I wanted to come back to. Dang, I, I can't. Bl- I'm blanking out on this, and I need the maybe the the calm spot of a break. Or if any of you remember what I well, what point I said I needed to check out that other article, then uh, that would probably help me track this thing down. Hmm. Okay. Uh, All right. I think I'm in the right spot here in terms of uh, when this came up. Ah, yes. Right. The secret meeting thing. Right. Okay, good. I knew enough scrolling would get us to this. Uh, CNN's story. CNN's reporting by Vicki Ward back on November 16th. That would be Saturday. Their exclusive story. After a private White House meeting, Giuliani associate Lev Parnas said he was on a secret mission for Trump, sources say. Uh, This, by the way, I think I originally filed this away as a counter to the uh, the usual Trump play of I don't know him. Right. I don't know these gentlemen, Parnas and Fruman. Um, And. the you know the idea being uh, I didn't have anything to do with them. We we certainly weren't in on any conspiracy together. I barely know who they were. They're very unimportant people. I may have photographs with them, but I have take 
pictures with everyone. Uh, we now get an explanation for the first photo that I saw of Parnas and Fruman with Trump. And you may recall, this is the photo that we saw that was, it was cropped in an interesting way, showing Fruman, Parnas, Trump, and Giuliani in what looked like one of the rooms of the White House. And it had been cropped in a weird way, and no one noticed in particular that it had been cropped until a few days later, the same photo circulated again, this time uncropped. And you could see that the person who had been cropped out for whatever reason was Mike Pence. Now that Mike Pence is a little more firmly in the middle of all of the uh, doings in this affair, I guess he's back into the picture. Anyway, when we first circulated the thing, people were looking closely at the picture and saying, is Rudy Giuliani wearing a yarmulke in this picture or is there a weird shadow behind him? Because it looks like the same shadow appears to make it look like there might be a yarmulke on Lev Parnas and Igor Fruman, which would be more appropriate perhaps because they're Jewish and Giuliani is not, but there was no yarmulke visible on Mike Pence, not that that was ever going to happen, or even Donald Trump, although I think I've seen him in one, but this one might have sunk into his hair. Anyway, as it turns out, the reason that at least three of the participants in the picture were wearing yarmulkes is that they were there for a White House Hanukkah party. That was where the picture was taken. We learn this in the CNN reporting, which says this, among the many guests who had their pictures taken with President Donald Trump, he remembered that, at the White House's annual Hanukkah party, and it's not always annual, they don't do it every year, last year were two Soviet-born businessmen from Florida, Lev Parnas and Igor Fruman, in the picture, which Parnas posted on social media. He and Fruman are seen smiling alongside Trump, Vice President Mike Pence, and Rudy Giuliani, the president's personal lawyer. At one point, during the party that night, I need like sound effects for this, and I don't have any, but okay. During the party that night, Parnas and Fruman slipped out of a large reception room where they could be anybody. A picture's taken with everybody. They slipped out of that large reception room, packed with hundreds of Trump donors, to have a private meeting with the president and Giuliani. I don't know these guys. I just have private meetings with them in the White House. This according to two acquaintances in whom Parnas confided right after the meeting, unless he's a lying mobster. That's one of the confounding elements in all of this. Where did the encounter in the White House last de last December, which has not been previously reported, although we saw the pictures of it, we just didn't know what it was, so it kind of has been, is further indication that Trump knew Parnas and Fruman, despite Trump publicly stating that he did not on the day after the two men were arrested at Dulles International Airport last month. Um, but I guess it was the month before last now. Event, uh, well, no. Right, it was last month. Well, time flies when you're having fun and arresting Lev Parnas. Eventually, according to what Parnas told his confidants, the topic turned to Ukraine that night. How mysterious that the topic should turn to Ukraine. But it did. According to those two confidants, Parnas said that, quote, the big guy, as he sometimes refers to the president in conversation, talked about tasking him and Fruman with what Parnas described as a secret mission to pressure the Ukrainian government to investigate Joe Biden and his son Hunter. I can't believe it. In the days immediately following the meeting, Parnas insinuated to the two people he confided in that he clearly believed he'd been given a special assignment by the president, like some sort of James Bond mission, according to one of the people. To, I, yes, uh, we have the all. I have some special equipment for you, Lev. Here is a stick of dynamite that blows up in your face. <laughs> Good job. Light it up. Well, he did it. To Parnas, the chain of command was clear. Giuliani would issue the president's directives, while Parnas, who speaks fluent Russian, would be an on the ground investigator alongside Fruman, who has numerous business contacts in Ukraine although you would need to speak fluent Ukrainian, presumably. Uh, there, although I, I imagine that there are a lot of people who speak both, and so uh, it's useful. At any rate, Parnas viewed the assignment as a great crusade, says one of the people in whom Parnas confided. He believed he was doing the right thing for Trump. The White House did not respond to repeated requests for comment. 
yada yada. I think uh, we can skip that part. Giuliani, through his lawyer, Robert Costello, remember the lawyers have lawyers in this, denies that any private meeting took place that night at the White House, saying it was a mere handshake and photo opportunity. Costello says uh, also rejects Parnas's claims of being put on a James Bond-style mission, saying that Parnas is no Sean Connery and that he suffers from delusions of grandeur. That is not far from believable. I will give you that. Joseph Bondi, a lawyer for Parnas, told CNN, Mr. Parnas at all times believed that he was acting only on behalf of the president as directed by his personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, and never on behalf of any Ukrainian officials. The lawyer, uh, a lawyer for Fruman, declined to comment for this article. In the past, Giuliani has been circumspect, really, about how he became associated with Parnas. Ah, yes, about that. And Fruman. In previous conversations with CNN, Giuliani has refused to identify his contact, simply stating that a well-known investigator connected him with Parnas. Ken McCallan, a former federal prosecutor with numerous high-level clients in Ukraine, including former and, government, former and current government officials, told CNN that he's heard a similar story about the Hanukkah party encounter. Wow, very famous for such a brief handshake and photo session. Parnas told some of McCallan's clients and contacts in Ukraine about the encounter. Parnas told everyone in Ukraine about the White House meeting. He was adamant he was their guy, that they chose him to be, that they chose him to be ambassador in Ukraine. I guess not real actual ambassador, but uh, the unofficial back channel ambassador, even though they hadn't really done that. And in February this year, according to a report in the Wall Street Journal, Parnas and Fruman met with the Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko and then Prosecutor General Yuri Lutsenko. During that meeting, they extended Poroshenko an invitation for a state dinner at the White House if he would commit to publicly opening investigations in Ukraine. That hasn't really been much talked about that uh, there was interest in having Poroshenko do that, and the quid pro quo was the same. The December meeting at the White House is not the first report of Parnas and President discussing Ukraine, by the way. The Washington Post has reported that in April of 2018, at a small fundraising dinner in a suite at the Trump International Hotel in Washington, Parnas told Trump that the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, Maria Ivanovich, was unfriendly to him and his interests, and according to the reports, Trump said she should be fired. Welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Um, was uh, yeah, It's just a, the brief, the one-minute break doesn't give me quite as much time as I thought I had here. But uh, when I was scrolling back, I don't know if I'm going to be able to come up with the Derek Harvey story just by searching his name because I don't know whether this search function looks for uh, text in the articles or just the headlines. It feels like it's sometimes just the headlines. Anyway, uh, if I recall correctly, Derek uh, Derek Harvey and Kash uh, was it Kash Patel? Was was it, I can't recall his last name now. Uh, but uh, oh, there we are. Hmm. No, giving us the wrong names, the wrong search. Okay. Well, I think that the uh, the my recollection is that the stories about them were that they had accompanied. Uh, or, or not that they had accompanied Nunez on this one, but that they had made a trip independent of Nunez um, or without Nunez at his direction to London to try to contact Christopher Steele as well. So he's just a globetrotter, this Derek Tom uh, Harvey guy is. And uh, in this case, um, he made trips uh, not only trying to contact Steele in London, but also... Uh, following an itinerary arranged for him by Lev Parnas, who thought he was a secret agent dispatched by the president. Okay, <clears throat> that in this next the CNN article that we were just reading. Uh, so as we left off, they uh, the Hanukkah party wasn't the first time that he buttonholed Trump and harangued him about Ukraine somehow, or in Parnas's telling of it that he was uh, that the president was busy recruiting him into his Ukraine scheme. 
But uh, rather that in April of 2018, they met at a fundraiser at the Trump Hotel in Washington, where Parnas told Trump that Yovanovitch was unfriendly to him and his interests. Trump, according to the Washington Post report, which cited people familiar with Parnas's account of the event, suggested that Yovanovitch should be fired. And then a year later, in May 2019, he finally got that done and Yovanovitch was recalled from her post. Other reporting along the way uh, makes clear that the president thought that she had been removed at some point several times in the year that intervened between April 2018 and her final removal in May of 2019. So there's more. Another close encounter, as a matter of fact, is the next section of the article. A separate encounter, also not previously disclosed, between Parnas and the president could provide further evidence that Parnas and Trump knew each other. In August of 2018, months before the White House Hanukkah party, Trump traveled to upstate New York. Well, that'll catch your ear, uh, Greg. We've been talking about upstate New York quite a bit lately. Traveled to upstate New York to attend a fundraiser for then-Republican Congresswoman Claudia Tenney. She's not anymore, right? Among the handful of wealthy donors in attendance was Parnas. Curious. Photos viewed by CNN provided by two of the attendees feature Parnas mingling with people and having his picture taken alongside Trump. Both attendees said they got the impression that Trump and Parnas knew each other. During a QA and a session, Trump called Parnas by his first name, though they did have nameplates in front of them, but of course he's blind and can't possibly have seen that. One of the sources said Parnas seemed quite proud of his interaction with Trump. These meetings add further understanding to the extent to which Parnas and Fruman, aided by Giuliani, entered into the president's inner circle. CNN has recently reported that since 2014, there are eight documented times when Parnas and the president were with each other, including taking pictures together at campaign events and attending high-dollar fundraisers. Parnas, a prolific user of social media, tended to post those encounters with Trump. But the photo of Trump and Parnas together at the White House in December is the last encounter that Parnas posted of himself with the president. The two sources who Parnas confided in about the Hanukkah meeting at the White House tell CNN that they were often with Parnas over the past 18 months and that he worshipped the president. That's in quotes, worship. Next up, though, Parnas disenchanted with Trump. However he felt back then, those two sources say, Parnas now feels quite differently about Trump. The day after Parnas and Fruman were arrested on October 9th and charged with criminal campaign finance violations, Trump publicly denied ever knowing them, a move that was enormously upsetting to Parnas, according to three sources close to him. I don't know these gentlemen, Trump told reporters from the South Lawn of the White House on October 10th. Maybe they were clients of Rudy. You'd have to ask Rudy. I just don't know. Everything's talked to Rudy, right? In the week since his arrest, Parnas has become disenchanted with Trump. That'll happen when you're arrested and thrown under the bus. But you knew he was a, what was it? You knew he was a snake. You knew he was an alligator. You knew he was whatever, however the retelling of the, the parable happens to fit, right? But you knew what you were getting into. Couldn't possibly have come as a surprise to you. I didn't think he would eat my face says Lev Parnas. In the weeks since his arrest, though, Parnas has become disenchanted with Trump, these sources say. He's even signaled that he's willing to cooperate with the congressional impeachment inquiry. Parnas's lawyer, Bondi, said his client would comply with congressional subpoena for documents and testimony as part of the impeachment inquiry in a manner that would allow him to protect his Fifth Amendment rights against self-incrimination. So... I don't know how much use it is, but okay. Prosecutors allege Parnas and Fruman illegally funded Republican politicians and campaigns with money from foreign nationals. Prosecutors also say the pair funneled $325,000 into Trump's flagship super PAC, America First Action, from an unknown source. Both Parnas and Fruman have pleaded not guilty and are currently out on bail and on house arrest in Florida awaiting trial. Both men also have a history of being accused of wrongdoing in civil court filings, though they were never criminally charged. It's a link to, I guess, all the various cases in which they've been accused of wrongdoing. One allegation against Parnas from 2008 involves a man who says he was threatened by Parnas after the man accused him of squatting in his Sunny Isles beach condo. Now, why would he be there? 
Parnas denied making the threat and told police he'd been renting the condo without a lease based on a verbal agreement with the man. That usually works out pretty good. Uh, Sonny Isles, in case you don't remember or weren't around with us when we read those extensive reports from Reuters, was it? About uh, Sunny Isles Beach being the place where there are seven, I think, Trump Tower, Trump buildings, or Trump-branded uh, condo uh, condo buildings. And they are populated almost entirely by Russians or people who grew up in the former Soviet Union, uh, some of whom are still Russian citizens, very popular with the lower level oligarchy, uh, motorcycle gang members, et cetera, et cetera, and also a popular place, popular destination for the Russian maternity tourism trade. Uh, oligarchs and lower level oligarchs send their girlfriends there to give birth, stay in Sunny Isles Beach in the condo there, give birth in Florida so the kid will be an American citizen so that uh, we can dispatch him on secret missions, James Bond style, at the behest of the Manchurian candidate, no puppet, no puppet, you're the puppet president. We'll have another one eventually. Don't worry, the kid will get his chance. Fruman's est estranged wife, uh, the one with whom he's happily married and has six kids, five still living at home, I guess, or not. Fruman's estranged wife, uh, hmm, uh, Yelisa, Te Yelisa Deva, y Yelisa Veta. There, oh, Elizabeth, I guess. Yelisa Veta Naumova, or Naumova. Hmm. I don't know about the pronunciation of last time, but I will say it's just Elizabeth. Sounds like in Ukrainian. Yelisa Veta Naumova, now estranged, accused him during their divorce proceedings of beating her and possessing a large amount of cocaine and other drugs, which he allegedly wrapped and passed out as party favors, which is what you're supposed to do with it, isn't it? But anyway, uh, I digress. Fruman denied the allegations. No, so he kept it all. Got it. Parnas's relationship with, oh, I'm sorry, Fruman's estranged wife. Ah, I'm confusing the two of them. So Fruman's divorced, but Parnas is happily married to six children or something like that. I think I've got it all straight now. Parnas's relationship with Giuliani and Fruman has also been strained. Hmm. Parnas is two confidants tell CNN. That's a far cry from the days when the trio frequently met at the Trump Hotel and chartered a flight together. Hmm. Is that right? Uh, do I know that story? That's not, not the, the one-way tickets to Vienna. That's something else. Chartered a flight together. Ah, I don't think we read this one, but it's an interesting title. CNN story entitled, starting with a quote, from Parnas. I'm the best paid interpreter in the world. Indicted Giuliani associate Lev Parnas touted windfall from Ukrainian oligarch. That would be the fake translation job with Dmitry, Dmitro Furtosh. And as between him and his lawyers, Vicky Tensing and Joe DeGeneva, uh, sounds like he's, he himself is spoofing the idea that he was actually there for translating. I'm the best paid translator in the world. Okay. I'll have a look at that, but maybe later. We'll continue with the first article. Last December, the day before the Hanukkah meeting at the White House, Giuliani brought Parnas as his guest to the funeral of former President George H.W. Bush. That was odd, wasn't it? Now Giuliani and Parnas snipe at each other through their lawyers. Unlike Fruman, Parnas is no longer represented by one of the president's former lawyers, John Dowd. I don't think I had noted that change. We, we left off of Parnas, the Parnas saga, for a couple of days. We must have missed that one. Igor has much more money than Parnas and can afford a strong defense team. And yet, well, Parnas is the one with five lawyers. Says one of their confidants, trying to explain the split. I, you know, it should come as no surprise that there are so many contradictory things we're learning about this probable mobster. You're going to want to have multiple cover stories to cloud the issues. Meanwhile, Parnas is trapped without his phones, now in the possession of the government, in his house in Boca Raton, Florida. His former friends don't reach out. How would he know? He doesn't have his phones. Not wanting to get involved in the multiple investigations that plague him. In a strange way, I feel sorry for Lev, for the mess he's in now, says one of his confidants. The, he never thought he did anything wrong. 
He was working for a president he really believed in. He was a hustler, but also a nice man who gave people gifts, unlike Fruman, who kept all the cocaine, according to Fruman. His wife says he was giving everybody gifts. Anyway, I would think this is all deeply upsetting for him. And I guess it is. And uh, I don't know whether we're meant to feel sad or not, but that's the end of that article. Um, curious a little bit about this other one. This one was from early November. November 1st, I'm the best paid interpreter in the world. Uh, story, Lev Parnas, and this one, Fruman, Fertash, Giuliani. Is it extensive? It's about the same length as the last one. Um but I don't know that we, well, there's some other interesting stuff there, but I'll, I'll put that one in pocket and maybe we'll go back and yeah, we'll, we'll may add that to the mix, depending on what happens over the course of the next few minutes and the rest of the show. But uh, I do think I want to go back into pocket and poke around a little bit and see if there's more that I wanted to share with you um, that follows from that and I am not certain if there's anything in particular that would demand being read next but there is an awful lot so alright well we'll start back in that area uh, sometimes these things because when they get grouped um, chronologically by when I find them uh, they often have something important to do with one another. What is this one here? Um, this one makes mention of the same players here. A thread reader thread put together here. Um, and who put it together? Well, Rick Petri is the author. I feel like that's somebody we've heard from before, although uh, his Twitter bio doesn't make anything immediately obvious um, about who he is or why we might think we've heard from him before. Eh. All right, well, let's see. The Thread Reader app, and then right next to it in Pocket was perhaps another... Is this what led me to it, or is this something else? No, something different. Okay, uh, all right. Well, let me take a look at this thread reader app here. The thread begins back on November 15th, uh, not that long ago. I suspect, says Rick Petri, P-E-T-R-E-E, -E -E, I suspect Wall Street Journal's reporting of the Southern District of New York investigation into Giuliani's involvement with Furtosh, Parnas, and Fruman is trying to hijack Ukraine's in trying to hijack Ukraine's largest natural gas company, Naftogaz, here we are, now I know why I'm here, will prove to be the first of several layers of corrupt activities by Giuliani's crew, and he puts that in scare quotes, you know, making a mobster reference crew, in Ukraine. Um, and I believe I probably put this away because I suspect the same thing uh, and uh, have shared again recently my thinking about uh, in, uh, from a tweet in October 2nd that it seemed to me right away that the interest that Parnas and Fruman had in removing Yanukovych, not Yanukovych, but uh, Yovanovich uh, from her ambassadorial post and in uh, implicating the Bidens through Burisma, as well as uh, implicating others in NAFTA gas, was all about them creating space for their newly formed uh, purported natural gas concern to move into Ukraine and grab a large part of that market and make billions for them. Then, in other words, they were only interested in uh, pursuing the Bidens insofar as they knew that that was of interest to Giuliani because it was of interest to the president and that by as long as they kept them on the line interested in what Parnas and Fruman had to say because it would lead eventually to dirt on Biden and they were able to trade that in their own quid pro quo. I'll find you the dirt on Biden or create the dirt on Biden if you do me the favor of getting these people out of the way and making sure that I get a natural gas contract in Ukraine and can become a billionaire oligarch through that business. 
but I need the American government to bulldoze the way for me here. I can't walk in as a nobody and get rid of the CEO of Naftagaz and bury my competition, Burisma and others, so that the field is cleared for me without the American government providing the bulldozing or the suppressing fire that it would take to get people off of my path. All right. So Rick Petrie says here, uh, I suspect Wall Street Journal's reporting of the investigation into Giuliani's involvement with Furtosh, Parnas, and Fruman in trying to hijack Naftagaz will prove to be the first of several layers of corrupt activities in Ukraine. Giuliani's activities, and I guess he's including in in his, uh, I forget how Thread Reader app actually puts these things together. I mean, I could look at the original tweet and that would help make things clearer about when he's quoting from the Wall Street Journal and when he's not. That was his, so, so far we've just read his introduction to the thread. Then he comments, Giuliani's activities and contacts in Ukraine are wider and of longer standing than the events covered in the Yovanovitch hearing today, the other day, of course, or the Naftogaz related investigation reported by the Wall Street Journal. This is a good summary, and he points to the Mother Jones article entitled Rudy Giuliani has a long, shady history with Ukraine. Subtitle, it's a lot more than seeking dirt on Biden. We should probably read that at some point. Trump's involvement in Furtosh and Giuliani's schemes regarding Naftagaz cannot be ruled out. Yes, he wanted Deza on Biden, I guess the dirt on Biden, etc. But it seems in character that he'd also be interested in any business deal arranged by a personal lawyer assiduously leveraging their relationship. I see the removal of Ambassador Yovanovitch, Rick continues, as a first move in a concerted effort led by Giuliani on behalf of Trump to co-opt the Zelensky administration, roll back the anti-corruption thrust of post-2014 Ukrainian society, and reinstall a Russian-friendly power structure. Hmm. If Zelensky had given... The Zakaria interview, Fareed Zakaria, right? Pledging publicly to investigate the Bidens, Trump would have had important compromat on Zelensky. And I think he still does. I accept, well, I think he's embarrassed Zelensky tremendously. And Zelensky very well may have to do a lot of backtracking. Remember, he was elected as, you know, the outsider guy, the new face who was not tainted by corruption. And of course, he would therefore be the only one who could promote a real independent anti-corruption program. But it's very much about the Ukrainian people's belief in him as a genuine actor here. And it has been suggested, at the very least, by the testimony of uh, David Holmes, who is, in fact, on the panel with Fiona Hill today, that he overheard from Sondland's conversation that it was Sondland's belief, and he expressed this belief to Trump, that Zelensky not only loved his ass, but that he would do anything that we that Trump asked him just so long as... Now, I mean, the thing you have to keep in mind, if you're a Ukrainian voter and tuning in, the thing you would want to keep in mind, at least for now, is that uh, it's not posited by anyone here that Zelensky is enjoying his time in Trump's pocket. He is, I would imagine, anguished at being asked to do anything uh, in exchange for what he probably thinks he would be entitled to with any other normal president, that as an ally or uh, not an ally per se, but as a friendly nation, uh, but a frontline nation locked in actual combat with Russia uh, and one that was trying to, uh, you know, root out corruption and westernize and possibly join the various Western alliances that are very important to us, uh, that we would be very interested in making a show of American support for Ukraine in the face of Russian aggression and almost every other president imaginable would have made that meeting, but Zelensky can't get it. Um, Zelensky likely knew because of the reputation that Trump enjoys, quote unquote, enjoys in 
the former Soviet republics, it's probably well known what kind of player he is and why he would be withholding the support. And they would know two things. One, that he probably owed his allegiance to Putin and so therefore wasn't going to do anything to help Ukraine. But he was somehow somewhat limited, somewhat hemmed in by the fact that he was supposedly president of the United States and would be expected uh, unless he just wanted to give himself over entirely to the picture of him being Putin's puppet. He would want to make some conciliatory move here and eventually have him to the White House. But it was extraordinarily important to Zelensky to get that meeting in order to deliver on his promises to the Ukrainian people. And then he had to swallow hard to say, all right, well, ultimately what I'm being asked to do is announce that there's an investigation. And he doesn't say I have to do the investigation itself, although I'm sure that Trump was going to come back later and say, now that you're compromised, I demand that you announce the following scripted material as the conclusion of your very thorough and very official and totally non-corrupt investigation. And whether Zelensky saw that coming or not, I don't know. But in to attribute some good faith to him, it seems like he was willing to say, all right, if all I have to do is give a interview on CNN and say we're opening an investigation and then I get the things I need to save Ukraine from Russia, that that might be enough to excuse him from blame or for the entirety, the full weight of the blame that might otherwise come down on him if there were no other explanation. And then all of a sudden, although he was elected as an anti-corruption candidate and not business as usual, he instead intended to knuckle under immediately, not only to the Americans, but Donald Trump himself, Mr. Corruption himself, and uh, and it was all a lie. I mean, that was a tough choice for him to have to weigh, I'm sure. Anyway, uh, where do we leave off here? Yes. Um, right. So remember here that uh, Rick is saying, I see the removal of Ambassador Yovanovitch as the first move in a concerted effort led by Giuliani on behalf of Trump to co-opt the Zelensky administration, bad news for poor Zelensky, roll back the anti-corruption thrust of post-2014 Ukrainian society and reinstall a Russian-friendly power structure. How annoying would that be to the vast majority of Ukrainians who not only uh, elected Zelensky, but elected his party to an outright majority in their parliament? Huge frustration of their purpose, but Americans don't care about the popular will of foreigners. They just don't. If Zelensky had given the Zakaria interview, Rick continues, pledging publicly to investigate the Bidens, Trump would have had important compromat on Zelensky, as he still does. The quid pro quo should be seen, among other things, as an attempt to break Zelensky. Uh, so I think Zelensky probably at this point could do himself a favor by flipping, quite honestly. Uh, he's not going to get the help out of the American president that he thinks or that some people think he might get. He may never believe that Trump himself is ever going to help him. But Trump has shown that he's got the ability to stand in the way of help offered to the Ukrainians even by Congress, uh, which, you know, we've discussed it before, uh, highlights just how serious Trump's decision to ignore constitutional demands about the purse strings really is. Zelensky should be able to rely on overwhelming bipartisan support in Congress to overcome Trump's being in Putin's pocket, but he can't because of Trump's rampant illegalities. That's bad news. As Yovanovitch testified, Giuliani's efforts in the irregular channel were diametrically opposed to stated U.S. policy. Assuming Giuliani was operating as Trump's agent, what we have is a POTUS secretly subverting U.S. foreign policy and national security policy for personal gain. Yes, true. And uh, perhaps another tweet thread will help nail that down a little bit more clearly after this next break upcoming. Had they not been caught in the act, Trump and Giuliani stood to accomplish two things, Rick posits. One, advancing Putin's interests in reasserting influence, if not control, over Kiev, and two, opening a no-holds-barred playground in Ukraine for their own corrupt business activities. I would note here, 
uh, if Rick doesn't get around to it, that that is the playground on which Parnas and Fruman were hoping to play and profit. On this understanding of events, it's clear that in, as in so much else with Trump, the play was in concert with and supportive of Putin. As others have noted, the Ukraine story, quote unquote Ukraine story, should be understood as part of the larger story of Trump's relationship with Russia. And we certainly believe that here now, eventually, at long last, we do believe that. Rick uh, finishes up by tweeting around a tweet from another of the people with whom he's having this discussion, Lucy CM, who says, Trump, quote, I really hope that Russia, because I really believe that President Putin would like to do something, I really hope that you, Zelensky, and President Putin get together and can solve your problem. That would be a tremendous achievement, and I know you're trying to do that. Hmm. Okay, well, no one believes that but him, I guess. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the Kegel in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Let's see. Uh, the uh, next next step in the progression here, I guess. Uh, I have another tweet thread here from the frequently shared by Greg Dworkin, Tom Nichols, Radio Free Tom. I usually, I don't share him nearly as frequently as Greg does, but I think he makes the, well, I'll say this. I was going to say, oh, I think he makes an excellent point here. I think he makes the same point that, or uh, in a, a similar point, uh, maybe in better fashion to a point that I have been discussing both on the air and on Twitter. And so therefore it's a genius point that needs to be shared. But I've been thinking a little bit about, I think it makes a good follow up on what we just heard from Rick Petrie here. Um, but uh, let's see, I feel like this is something that we've shared <clears throat> in the past. But uh, let me read Tom's formulation of this. We I, Did we discuss this yesterday? I know I've been discussing this on Twitter lately and in, usually in answer to uh, protests from Republicans and like Jim Jordan and Dan Crenshaw, who keep uh, insisting that the president had every right to hold up the the Ukrainian aid and that uh, as Jim Jordan formulates it well you know he was doing what we would all want him to do he wanted to root out corruption in Ukraine and so he was holding on to the aid so until we could better vet Zelensky and find out whether he's the real deal and whether the money will really be used to fight corruption etc cetera, etc cetera. uh and there's a there's a universe in which that would be a credible cause, right? Um, well, you may say, uh, as many people have, as many Democrats have pointed out, and it is correct. Well, the Congress baked that into the uh, appropriation. That is, uh, they made the appropriation. Remember in our long discussion, our big political science uh, exploration of how a decision to appropriate money to Ukraine gets made and you're bringing in issue area experts and the State Department testifies and the Defense Department testifies. Part of the testimony there would be to point up where the issue area experts along the way have studied the question of how are they doing with cleaning up corruption there in Ukraine and uh, it, it, have things progressed since the 2014, as they call it, what is it, Revolution of Dignity? Uh, are we on a steady course towards decorrupting things there in Ukraine? Uh, does the current government, uh, are they to be trusted with money like this? And uh, 
that there were opportunities built into the system for uh, requiring that the departments sponsoring or asking for these appropriations to Ukraine certify that Ukraine is doing the right thing with the money we're sending them and can be trusted with this kind of money and to, to carry out this kind of purpose with that money. And it has been so certified along the way. Um, and, and we found that pointed out in various articles we've read along the way. And then, uh, you know, the insistence of the defense department, um, certify that they could make <clears throat> proper use of the defensive weapons that we were offering them. And they did it in a day, right? You know, we, we know this because we've already done this study. But Republicans have been insisting, well, it's the president's prerogative to hold that money up and say, we really need to check that out. Because all of these studies, you could argue, were conducted with the idea in mind that we would be providing these this assistance to the Petro Poroshenko administration in Ukraine. And we now have a different uh, Zelensky administration. Is this guy going to be you know, dealing squarely with the money that we send to his administration. It's arguable. You could you could need a new study. The problem with that, of course, is that, yes, the president has the prerogative or can exercise through valid procedure the prerogative to hold that aid briefly while those questions are answered. The only requirement that there is uh, to, to put things simply, to oversimplify, the, the only requirement that there is for the president to put that excuse on l decent legal footing, it doesn't prove that it's correct, and it would be the, the regular kind of use of presidential prerogatives that we see all the time, that it's like, well, I suspect that there are other motivations here, but we don't have room to question the motivation because he's invoking one to which he's entitled and we can't prove that it's false, at least not in time to do anything about it. And the courts likely won't take the case because it's within the president's prerogative to do this if he claims that this is the reason and he does claim it. And though upon further examination, we might find that's not the case. You don't have enough evidence to get the court to intervene in a question like this. So you're on your own, Right. But all you have to do, therefore, is say, uh, well, there's a real there's a real path to this. The president doesn't know whether or not the Zelensky administration can be trusted with this money the way he may have believed the Poroshenko uh, administration could be trusted with the money, although by all accounts, he didn't trust that either. But that could be the claim. All the president would have to do, therefore, is notify Congress that I'm putting this hold, temporary hold on this money because I want to find this out. I want to vet Zelensky. Now, the idea that Donald Trump is putting a hold on anything because he wants to do one of his famous vetting jobs when he's the world's worst vetter of anyone for any purpose is laughable on its face anyway. But what's even worse is that he would have gotten away for he could have gotten away with it had he provided notice to Congress. You've just got to tell Congress I'm holding this money up for this reason. That gives a Congress notice. Congress is the one who holds the purse strings. You got to tell them when you're doing something to confound their control of the purse strings. And two, you got to tell them why so that it's not arbitrary and capricious. Remember, big throwback there. Give a real reason, and the real reason that you want to give the real reason is Congress should be able to argue back. No, we think those conditions have been satisfied because they're the ones with the primary interest here. It's their purse string or our purse strings, but they get to hold them. Okay, we'll formulate it that way. That's the job. That's the division of labor in the Constitution. All he had to do, though, was say here that A, that I'm doing it, and B, here's why. Why? What is the non-corrupt reason for refusing to tell Congress, I'm screwing with the purse strings just for a minute, but for very good reason. I am, after all, deeply concerned. I might say if I were Susan Collins, I'm deeply concerned with corruption in Ukraine. I have this narrative of corruption in Ukraine. People will believe it. I'd believe it if you had just said it. 
but he refused to say it. And the problem with refusing to say it is it is a violation of the normal channels that raises the appearance of impropriety red flags. And now we're in the trouble zone. We're already in the, you know, I don't know what you want to, we've, we've gone right into the danger zone is what we've done here. And a red flag has gone up. There's now an appearance of impropriety. All I had to do was say I was holding up the money and why, and I won't do it. Not only not why, I mean, you'd have a, uh, ostensibly a violation if I said, I'm holding up the money, Congress, uh, but I won't tell you why. It'd be a gray area. I've told you, but I didn't give a good reason. Well, we'll see whether any courts think that not giving a good enough reason to Congress for holding up the money is good enough reason for Congress to sue you over it. And in most cases, the answer will be no, or the case will be mooted very quickly because the money will move anyway before the case gets to court. Uh, but here, not even notice that they've done it, which is double trouble, right? The two red flags have gone up. Now there's twice the appearance of impropriety. And all we're left with, because of the appearance of impropriety red flags have gone up, is the bad assumption that this is being done for nefarious reasons. As it happens, there's a ready nefarious reason available at a glance for explaining this thing. And then, of course, they blurted it out on the White House lawn and Mulvaney said what it was. And then so did Giuliani. And that just complicated matters. OK, so that's the setting in which I read this Tom Nichols thread, which I'll now share with you. OK, since the Republicans are going down this road, a quick explainer, he says, GOP questioners, he no doubt says GOP, questioners are saying that the president has the right to hold up legally approved aid. He does, but that's not what happened here. They're counting on their supporters being too stupid to know it. Maybe. Anyway, he continues and says, the president can determine if a country has not met the legal conditions for providing aid. If country X has a bad human rights record and the aide says, quote, on condition that country X stop arresting dissidents, unquote, POTUS can choose to determine that the conditions have not been met. That, that's true, too. A slightly different path to getting the same thing done. But again, still requires notice. But those then this is a different point he's making. For instance, saying he, the human rights record doesn't match with the requirements. Those, he says, are public conditions in the aid package, usually made as a determination after the interagency working groups have advised the president that country X is or isn't in compliance with the conditions of the aid. Congress, if it disagrees, can query White House officials. I'll just also add that usually as part of the interagency working process, um, the groups, the people working inside the interagency groups who would advise the president of the country X is or isn't in compliance would also have advised Congress in testimony to Congress about this proposed appropriation that they are or aren't worthy of it. And Congress, too, would have that in mind when they make their decision about the appropriations. Sometimes they'll make their decision about the appropriations in contravention to the experts that they hear from. But that, too, is something that they would have to explain along the way, although it would only be to their constituents that they would have to explain why they did it, if their constituents even cared. But they also will brief the president in all this, and the president, normal presidents, try to be in compliance with both what the experts are testifying and what the uh, Congress, uh, congressional appropriators think is appropriate. They will sometimes disagree as well, but generally speaking, there's agreement across the board on these things. If there isn't, or if Congress hears from the experts who say country X has met these thresholds and the president determines that in his view it has not, then, as he says, Congress can, if it disagrees, query White House officials. But of course, only if they know the aid has been held up, which he didn't bother to tell them. And they only discovered through one, the whistleblower report and the chain of events that that set off, and two, their staffers going to Ukraine to check on the money and finding that it had not yet arrived. Anyway, to continue with what Tom Nichols says, right? Congress, if it disagrees, can query White House officials. That is not this. 
in the Ukraine case, the executive branch officials, as Cooper is testifying now or was yesterday, the executive branch officials determined that Ukraine had met the conditions attached to aid. Trump then added secret conditions through the three amigos, maybe, uh, that were purely to benefit him. In other words, yes, there can be conditions put on aid, but they have to be public. Congress says the aid is being uh, appropriated, but it's only appropriated if these conditions are met. Or occasionally there are other conditions that are sort of out there as general standing orders that a president can invoke and say, it is generally within my power to say that there's a huge human rights issue in this country and we haven't, to my satisfaction, certified that they're meeting these conditions. I want to have this out with Congress and we'll argue and take some more testimony over that and come to a conclusion. What can't happen is the president can't look at what limitations there are legally on the money and then say, I'm going to add new ones that I make up and that I'm going to do. I'm going to make it up unilaterally. I am not authorized by Congress and have never been authorized by any courts so far to add any sort of conditions of my own, but I'm going to do it anyway. And they're going to be bad conditions and I'm going to keep them secret from everyone, except insofar as I'm incompetent in keeping secrets and I end up getting busted. But secret anything doesn't cut it with this stuff. Not only was he going to uh, add conditions without any authority to do so, not only was he going to keep those conditions secret without any authority to do so, but those conditions were going to be of no benefit to the United States of America uh, in its foreign policy or national security writ large. They were merely going to be benefiting me politically, problematic on several levels. In other words, Tom continues, Ukraine had met the conditions specified when Congress passed the law to grant the aid, but Trump wanted his own set of conditions that amounted to a promise by the Ukrainian president to embarrass Joe Biden on U.S. national television. And by the way, I just want to reiterate the point here that at one point it was, well, in order to get the White House meeting, they have to do this. All right, they're willing to do that. Well, in order to get the White House meeting and the uh, State Department assistance, they'll have to do this. Okay, we'll do it. Well, I mean, in order to do this, uh, get the White House meeting and the State Department assistance and the Defense Department assistance, they'll have to do this. Okay, we'll do it. Well, I mean... Not only do you have to do it, but the president of your country has to do it on television. He just kept moving the goalposts time after time after time. If Zelensky thought he was going to get what was coming to him after meeting those conditions without additional conditions being imposed, like additional conditions are being imposed on the money with respect to his relationship with Congress— He's an idiot. Obviously, Trump is in the uh, habit of nothing. There's no habit he displays more often than demanding more and more and more every time you say yes to him. So, as we said, in other words, again, in other words, Trump ignored the conditions set by law, ignored his own experts, ignored U.S. national security requirements, and said, none of this money moves until Zelensky does this humiliating thing that benefits no one else in the world but me personally. This is soliciting a bribe. Worse, it is extorting a country that is under attack by Russia. Not a normal hold on aid. Every member of Congress in that room knows this. They know it, but they're counting on their viewers over on Fox to not know it. And it's hideous. And I think that sums it up nicely. And I think a good way of looking at it that uh, supplements your viewing of today's hearings and all the hearings uh, between, uh, well, now and forever, I guess. All, all the hearings should be viewed in that context. Okay, so I think that's pretty interesting as well. And I thought a well-explained um, look at a, you know, a, a different angle from which to view what was going on today. I guess maybe... We'll keep it all on uh, Ukraine today, unless uh, this takes less time than I thought, in which case we'll sandwich in one more thing. But we still have the Friday show coming up, but I have an extraneous matter to 
comment on as well. But let's throw this one in there. Happened to notice this tweet um, flying by yesterday from Ryan Lizza. Uh, for my own reminder, Ryan is chief Washington correspondent for Politico and a senior analyst for CNN. Boy, he wears many hats and this, and everybody loves hats. So he tweeted yesterday, is that right? I think so, that, um, well, this may surprise people, he says, who only know Devin Nunes' recent record. And Devin Nunes used to be kind of a boring, you know, no drama-ish kind of guy before this Intelligence Committee assignment. But this may surprise people who only know his recent record. But late in 2015, Nunes told me, during a long interview in his office, that he was extremely concerned about the rise of conspiracy theorists in the Republican Party. Yes, uh, that is something to be concerned about, but is uh, doubly ironic, of course, because he's now the leading conspiracy theorist in the Republican Party. And once again, you wonder, how does that happen? Uh, I don't know if I really get the feel that it's because Trump or someone else has something on Nunes. I almost, I don't know what it is about Nunes, but I feel like he's come to this organically. I mean, it's hallucinatory, but I mean, psilocybin mushrooms, I guess, are organic, right? I, I, it's crazy, it's hallucinatory, but I think it can be arrived at organically just by throwing yourself into your work and getting invested in your position. I mean, that is to say, it could be happening to me right now and I wouldn't know it, just as he doesn't. But I hope it's not, and I have to firmly believe that I'm actually, you know, maybe smarter than Devin Nunes. But you never know. Anyway, this is an interesting thing. This doesn't have to do with his early career in Congress, which I recall Devin Nunes, by the way, being really boring and that his chief focus was like water rights issues in California. And, you know, I mean, that makes sense because... That's where he was from, and he was claiming to be a farmer, et cetera, et cetera. Back in those days, he may actually even have been involved in the running of a farm. That would make him concerned about water. But that was his chief thing. He was spent most of his time fighting about water rights in California with the federal government then under Barack Obama's administration. But then, okay, he moves to the Intelligence Committee looking for something more interesting to do and slowly slips into the conspiracy theory realm, telling Ryan Lissa in 2015, I'm worried about this. And there's a quotation from, you know, I don't know where. I guess Ryan must have written this up in 2015 after interviewing him. I don't have the link to the full article, but there's the, the juicy bit that he included for us. Quote, I used to spend 90% of my constituent response time on people who call, email, or send a letter such as, I really like this bill, HR 123. And they really believe in it because they heard about it through one of the groups that they belong to, but their view was based on actual legislation, Nunes said. 10% were about chemtrails from airplanes are poisoning me to every other conspiracy theory that's out there. And that has essentially flipped on its head. The overwhelming majority of his constituent mail now is about the far out ideas. And only a small portion is based on something that is mostly true. He added, it's dramatically changed politics and politicians and what they're doing. Wow. I mean, that's really kind of interesting to know about Devin Nunes and makes it difficult to understand how he shifted on this and how he shifted so quickly. But, I mean, I guess it's really intensive work. And, of course, we're always commenting how a single day seems like a year under the Trump administration. So 2015 seems like a million years ago politically. But, anyway, just sort of interesting. And I wonder whether he's still in there, you know. Could you have him read that comment and would he recognize himself in it and say, oh, yeah, I wonder what happened to me and try and find a way of climbing out of the hole or would he just be like now uh I, that's the old me i was before i was red pilled or blue pilled or whatever stupid pill it is that you're supposed to take to reveal the truth to yourself okay let's see lots of other things that definitely need discussion some major stories some minor points to current stories that we've already discussed today i don't believe 
that we're going to make it through any of the stories, the big stories that have been waiting to go here. I'll save this other small story for tomorrow. We'll just close out, I guess, the theme for the day. Let me borrow, uh, since time is of the essence, from Kerry Elleveld here, who wrote this for the front page uh, at Daily Coast. We put it up on the front page on Tuesday. And uh, I mentioned earlier at the top of the show that Putin in one setting or another, and I did grab the source for that, had said, yeah, okay, thank God nobody blames us for you know, interference in the uh, American elections in 2016 anymore. Uh, wishful thinking, of course, on his part. But anyway, this complimentary piece of the puzzle is wrapped up nicely, I think, by Kerry. Democratic Council highlights Putin's hand in inventing Trump's Ukraine conspiracy theory. You can see that he's interested in having that conspiracy theory believed around the world. Um, what was missing is, well... What's been missing from our storyline that I've recited here on the air is how he uh, planted that story so that it would be there for him to rely on now. Although the main focus, Kerry writes, of the congressional impeachment hearings have been centered on Donald Trump's efforts to extort Ukraine, the Democratic Council has also used his questioning to underscore the involvement of Russian President Vladimir Putin at pivotal moments in the scandal. During his questioning of National Security Council official and Ukraine expert Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, Democrats' lead counsel, Goldman, Daniel Goldman, has asked Vindman whether he knew that Putin had promoted the baseless theory that Ukraine interfered in the 2016 U.S. elections. Uh, the exchange is quoted here. Question. At the time of this July 25th call, Colonel Vindman, were you aware of the theory that Ukraine intervened or interfered in the 2016 U.S. election? Answer. I was. Are you aware of any credible evidence to support this theory? I am not. Are you also aware that Vladimir Putin had promoted this theory of Ukrainian interference in the 2016 election? I am well aware of that fact. And ultimately, which country did U.S. intelligence services determine to have interfered in the 2016 election? Answer, it is the consensus of the entire intelligence community that the Russians interfered in the U.S. elections in 2016 Goldman also noted the fact that Trump had a call with Putin in the critical spring time frame in which then-Ambassador to Ukraine Marie Ivanovich was removed from her post. Goldman uses April 21st as an initial marker because that's the date of Trump's first phone call with incoming Ukrainian President Zelensky, a call that was basically innocuous at its core. The question here, I want to ask you if you were aware of the following things that happened from April 21st to May 13th. Were you aware that Ambassador Yovanovitch was abruptly recalled from Ukraine at that time? Yes, of course he was. And he says the notification occurred toward the end of April and she was finally recalled in the May time frame, May 25th, if I recall correctly. Question. So she learned about it after the April 21st or rather April 24th. Is that right? Correct. And you were aware that President Trump had a telephone call with President Putin during this time period in early May? I was. And you were aware that Rudy Giuliani, were you aware, rather, that Rudy Giuliani had planned a trip to go to Ukraine to pressure the Ukrainians to initiate the two investigations that President Trump mentioned on the July 25th call at, in this time period? And the answer, I was aware that he was traveling there, and he was. He had been promoting the idea of these investigations, this very same conspiracy theory. Goldman also used his time questioning Yovanovitch last week to establish that Putin was the source of the disinformation about Ukraine interference. Goldman first showed her a statement that Putin made in early February 2017 during a joint press conference with the Hungarian Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, in which Putin stated, as we all know, during the presidential campaign in the United States, the Ukrainian government adopted a unilateral position in favor of one candidate. More than that, certain oligarchs, certainly with the approval of the political leadership, funded this candidate, or female candidate, to be more precise. Wink, wink. As an aside, parenthetically, it says, Republicans even parroted Putin's claim during the hearings that Ukraine supported Clinton. Goldman then asked Yovanovitch how such a claim of Ukrainian interference would benefit Putin. Yovanovitch replied that this was classic for an intelligence officer to try to throw off the scent and create an alternative narrative that might get picked up and get some credence. 
Putin has continually popped up at key points in this narrative, introducing and promoting the very idea that Ukraine meddled in 2016 when there's no evidence to support it. And even speaking with Trump right around the time of some of the most precipitous decisions, such as abruptly recalling Yovanovitch from her post. Look for Goldman to highlight more of Putin's involvement in Trump's Ukraine scandal throughout the rest of the public hearings. And indeed, for other people to uh, highlight his role in all this. And indeed, for Putin himself to speak up about uh, the thing and try and give it one more push over the goal line so that uh, Republicans and Fox-watching lunatics everywhere would come away with the idea that that's a real thing and real time ought to be burnt investigating it rather than what really happened here. Okay, time for us to wrap up and hand the microphone over to Justice Putnam for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Let's take advantage of the time we've got to tell you about what's coming up. Uh, let's see. Vanity Ambassador Sondland's testimony, nice title there, showed all roads lead back to Trump and Putin. On the rest of the menu, despite multiple deaths, Border Patrol is preventing doctors from administering free vaccines and medical care to detained refugees. There's much more as well. I'll share a little bit more with you after From this. Daily Coes Radio on NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to The K-Grow in the Morning Show with David Waltman. Always a helping of international news here on the show. Turkey arrested a lawyer hired by the German embassy heightening tensions between NATO, the NATO partners, and in a bit, to prevent it from becoming a pilgrimage site for neo-Nazis, Austria will turn Hitler's birthplace into a police station. That's a wise choice. 